go off on you. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome back. This is another Locally Optimistic Ask Me Anything live video interview session. Uh, it's not the pithiest name, but it's uh, descriptive. Uh, it's me, Simon Elderkirk. I'm a do data at WordPress.com. Really excited to be here. Thanks to Scott and everybody else at Locally Optimistic, as always, uh, for having us, for hosting the event. And today, super stoked uh, to be talking with Caitlin Mormon. And I, I want to say Yurtle. It's not Yurtle, right? <laughs> nope, it's Yurtle. <laughs> okay, of, of Yurtle Recommerce, which, as I understand, um, sells uh, Dr. Seuss books. Is that right? <laughs> We get that a lot. Okay. Much confusion. Um, we have not yet gone into the used book business. It tends, tends to be a little, little bit low margin. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we uh, partner with large brands to run resale sites. So like an REI or a Patagonia um, partners with Yertle. We run um, the online component of their site as well as the operational end of actually figuring out how to get small numbers of used items from one place to another to their next happy home. Um, there's lots of fun challenges. In yeah, that. that's rad. There must be so many, I bet, really <laughs> unexpected puzzles kind of behind that work. But uh, I really want to learn more about you. And I've read through your LinkedIn and I really, I just want to hear kind of about your journey because it seems like you've, you've sort of been in a bunch of different roles, always sort of vis-a-vis -vis data and sort of analysis and research. And I was wondering if you could kind of like flesh it out for us, sort of give us the, give us the, the longer version of what, what we'd find there. Um, sure. So when I was in college, I was sure I wanted to go work for a nonprofit somewhere abroad and never come home again. Um, and I, I studied economics and women's studies, but the economics was much more in the environmental economics and development economics kind of vein. Um, and one year, my mother insisted that I get one internship that paid me actual money and was based in the United States okay. um, and see how that worked out for me. And if I didn't love it, I could go do whatever I wanted. <laughs> She's like, just, just once, just try out one job where you won't abandon us and also ask us for money all the time, um, <laughs> which for the record, I was not a big money asker, but she was very fearful of it. So... Um, so I ended up working for a, um, a private equity firm that did growth stage investing. Uh, the specifics of the firm were weirdly well suited to me. They were, uh, it was a women owned firm focused on socially responsible companies um, and sort of, they thought of themselves as kind of next gen. So this was in the early 2000s when not all brands were quite aware of the fact that they needed to actually focus on sustainability and social impact of their products and things like that. So they were sort of a little bit ahead of the curve on that. Um, and so I ended up loving it and, you know, gave up on my dreams of moving somewhere that no one could ever reach me and moved to New York instead. <laughs> yeah. And I did that for a long time, I don't know, six or seven years. Um, and I really loved it. It's, it was just sort of a generalist role. It was all data driven, but not necessarily super um, technical. Mostly I was getting data sets from our portfolio companies and working on various strategic initiatives For around sure. that and doing all kinds of management roles too. At one point I was like general manager of one of our companies. Wow. It had 10 employees. This was not like a huge job, but That's you know, I was like 25. It was very strange. <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it was really fun. I got to try out a lot of different things and learn a lot about myself. One thing um, I learned was that I like to do quiet work. <laughs> okay, quiet work. I really um, enjoy kind of the sort of back of the house side of things. So I decided to, um, I, well, I decided to leave New York. That was the actual prompter of this. But when I looked for my next gig outside of New York, I decided to um, find something more data oriented, more kind of back of the house and less dealing with sort of the, all, all the myriad things that came along with some of the other roles I've been in. So, sure. um, yeah, so that was kind of the first role where I dove into data in depth. Um, and I was working for a startup that's based here in North Carolina called Lulu and they do uh, print on demand sure. and self published books. Um, and so I was there for a couple of years, 
learned learned SQL, learned how to do all kinds of things in really janky ways. We had really no infrastructure. Everything was, you know, cron jobs, raw SQL, <laughs> pasting data <laughs> from one place to another. Um, but it was it was fun and I really enjoyed it. So then I moved out to the Bay Area for a little while and while I was there, I worked for Indiegogo. Right. Um, I worked initially as a product analyst for them and then kind of ended up leading the team for a few years and recently left Indiegogo to join Yertle where I'm kind of doing it all over again, building a new team, That's right. building all the infrastructure, kind of starting from scratch and seeing where we go. So tell me a little bit about what, like what inspired you to, to write your latest article on Locally Optimistic? Ooh, um, yeah, I, so at the sort of most basic level, it's totally Tanya Riley <laughs> and the, the uh, talk that she does on glue work and just sort of reading that was one of those moments where I just felt so heard, <laughs> so seen. So, you know, it's just like a moment where someone puts words to your experience sure. um, in a way that's really powerful. And so I had been thinking about it a lot and kind of a lot of what I think about is how much we can steal analytics best practices from engineering and how much we can't. Oh, um, okay. yeah. <laughs> kind of what are the oh, boundaries wow. of that? Because awesome. they're really good at stuff. Engineers love to create processes that just work. Yeah. Turns out. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, um, you're right about that. And so, you know, thinking about management of an analytics team, some of that is applicable. Some of it is not just based on kind of the differences of the work. And that's, um, so I was, I was thinking through sort of, the way that Tanya Riley communicated about glue work and kind of what if that applies to analytics and what doesn't. Um, and one of the really interesting things to me as someone who's led an analytics team that reports into a non-technical function. Um, so I've always reported into marketing or finance or um, product and you're dealing with someone who has such a different point of view at the next level. A lot of what becomes glue work and analytics is actually the technical work because right. um, sort of sharing what your team is working on really speaks to those stakeholders when it is business impact, when it's all about kind of where, what's the decision that this is driving. But when you're talking about ETL, they just could not care less yeah, that, <laughs> and don't is, the value um, there. You know, there, there were two things that really, uh, rang out to me in your article on Locally Optimistic, which uh, if folks haven't read, you should totally read it. It's at locallyoptimistic.com. Uh, and uh, one of them was this idea of that, the, this idea that glue work is a little bit relative, right? Like it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a category around which we can draw hard lines and, and a little bit what, counts what ends up in the glue work category a little bit depends on who has the ability to promote you right? right and i was hoping you could say more about that like that's something i've i've kind of been thinking about a lot actually um, yeah i mean and you know that's one of the biggest differences between engineering and analytics is engineering tends to just be a technical organization it's technical all the way up and you're reporting to engineers all the way up until the cto um so no matter kind of where you are in there your manager and your manager's manager probably has a pretty good idea of what you do. Um, and kind of the definition then of glue work tends to be pretty consistent because you really know what's expected at each level. So if you're at a level where really the technical contribution is all that matters, then you know kind of everything else is what doesn't necessarily contribute to your next promotion. Um, and analytics is so different than that because you know, it, if it all depends on sort of what, what is promotable depends on how you get promoted in the organization. And so right. usually that requires um, your manager defending your promotion and really sort of being a cheerleader for you at pretty high levels within the organization. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's actually sort of a quota of <laughs> your C-level exec has this many promotions, this cycle. So they have to figure out how to use them. Sometimes it's, you know, not quite that 
elbow someone else aside to get what you want um, right, right. sort of trades off trade offs but you do still have to be able to communicate what the impact of your work is at multiple levels and analytics is interesting because it has a wide range of skill sets and a wide range of the types of impact that you can have the same person might work on something super technical for a quarter or six months and then you know the next six months they're working on something that's much more business facing and and how you communicate the impact of those different types of work and how that person is growing into a a somewhat cohesive role yeah. <laughs> is something that's sometimes hard to communicate to someone who doesn't think about this kind of work every day um, so when you're talking to the CFO <laughs> yeah. about whether or not your team gets gets the promotion this quarter, or there's someone on your team, then um, it becomes a, a sort of different conversation about impact. And that itself is work, right? You sort of end up in this place where you've <laughs> got to do sort of additional invisible work to make your other invisible work visible. Hey, that's hard. Yeah, it's a hard sort of a hard loop to get stuck in, I'd imagine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I... I I think a lot of it is really just around defining where you feel like you spend time that is important and isn't valued. And so, you know, because so many different things can be glue work, we can, you know, each person might have a very different perspective on this conversation. And it's, it's interesting to talk to people, you know, literally everyone I've talked to about this sees it and re reads the article and is like, man, this, feels really real, but they all have different reasons for why it feels real or like examples that they immediately go to of, oh my gosh, everyone, you know, I, I do this and it's so important and it's never acknowledged or, or whatever. Um, and so it, what I think is most important is like defining that between yourself and your manager. <laughs> right. Like within your exact situation, what does that look like? What are you spending a significant amount of time on that you're not sure whether it's really helping you get where you want to be um, and just figuring out like, yeah. is it not getting you where you want to be because it's not actually that important because I've certainly worked on projects that were important to me, but not important to the organization. And you know, that there's an, a cost to that. <laughs> right. um, or is it because someone doesn't appreciate the work that you're doing, whether that's your manager or your manager's manager or organizationally, and then figuring out kind of how you manage around that. You won't, you sort of you create this um, this sort of four square idea by introducing the competing ideas of something that is valuable versus something that is valued, right? And we've got four possible categories there, right? like both valuable and valued, um, valuable but not valued, uh, not valuable but actually valued, which is kind of an interesting one, right? Like like politics, I guess. Right. And then you've got um, neither, neither valued nor valuable. And how do you, like, I'm, how do you have this conversation with your manager, right? Like, how do you, how do you bring this up? Or, I mean, as someone who is in sort of a managerial role, like much more selfishly, I'm trying to figure out how do I say to someone, what are you doing that I'm not appreciating? Right. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you exist on either end of that conversation? Like, how does that work? Yeah. I mean, I think, so I've only ever had this conversation actually from the manager's role. Um, I don't think that I could have articulated this before I was a manager. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, from my perspective, I think it really is, it, it's basically exactly that question. And so you can frame that a number of ways. You can, if you have sort of a, an agreed upon job ladder that someone is working against, you can kind of look at it and say like, what do you spend a lot of time on that's not here? Like, what are you doing? that's not being measured here and let's figure out whether you should be doing that thing and it should be on this list or you know captured somehow um or whether you shouldn't be doing it and we need to find a different solution for whether that gets done at all or who does it or whatever um it makes it a lot easier if you kind of already have an agreed upon framework of what that person is working on next whether that's like an official job ladder or just a conversation about what your next priorities are um, and, you know, that's something I've traditionally done sort of quarterly with my team Sure. and go through what are your priorities this quarter and like, how do we make time for those things, <laughs> the things that are really moving you along, the things that are um, very clearly impactful to the business, but also impactful to your desire to sort of move along a path 
uh, in some direction. Right. Um, and then how do we clear the way to make that possible? Like what's, what are the annoying ad hoc things that keep you from making progress on that? What are, what are the time sucks that shouldn't be there? Right. It, what's your sense of, you know, this idea of glue work, it seems like the sort of classic examples or the ones that stand out to me kind of in, in Tanya's discussion are the kind of work that sort of nobody like is enthusiastic about doing. And then it sort of ends up falling on, you know, the people who are the most likely to volunteer for it or the people who are the least likely to like ignore it, I guess. Right. Um, and it kind of seems like you're, you're describing it as like also things that people are like actually really interested in, but aren't like necessarily visibly valuable. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the situation. And I think, you know, I've spent time with relatively junior engineers within um, organizations I've been in who really love sort of more of the product management side. And yeah, that's the case sure. where they, they do really love it. They want to do it. They like that stakeholder management. They like, knowing that when they actually sit down to write code, it is the best possible use of their time because they've gotten everybody on board and they understand all the edges and they're not going to be reworking anything. Right, right. Um, and in the absence of, you know, in a lot of organizations, there are times or there is always a lack, <laughs> a lack of that and just not enough people kind yeah. of focused on that coordination. Um, and so, you know, there are people who, who do really enjoy it. There are people who don't. And I think generally um, it's, it's a balance in finding, you know, if it's something that no one wants to do and it's not valued, <laughs> then you have to Just don't do it. Right. <laughs> either you don't do it. Um, if it's still, there's still stuff that sometimes has to be done. You just kind of have to assign it out and say, you know what, everybody has to share this crappy task. And I would say, you know, historically ad hoc requests have been something like that. Oh, for, for sure. Like yeah. who, who is actually paying attention to the Slack channel today <laughs> to see who's asking for annoying things that will distract you for 20 minutes. Absolutely. Um, and how do we divide that fairly? Um, but then there's also kind of the other side where if someone really likes doing that work, but it's not valued, where does that get them? And just make sure that they understand it. Like, you're making trade-offs here. You're moving down a different path. And so if you thought you were moving towards this promotion, like, let's be really clear, this isn't getting you there. And there's another path and maybe it's a, to another role. Maybe, you know, this is really more of a sort of project management role that you're moving towards. If that's interesting to you, if that's really where you want to be, then cool, because this work is helpful. It's just not valuable to sort of how we define this role. Um, and as long as there's sort of space for that in the organization and really like there is a growth trajectory, then that can be an okay outcome too. But you know, the worst thing about it, it, it from my perspective is that when there is that work that no one wants to do, women are the ones that step up and do it. Just like that happens in most homes, <laughs> in most workplaces, that is sort of the, the social, um, the way that we are socially conditioned. <laughs> And that's, that's the worst outcome of it is that, you know, if everyone is equally hampered by this kind of work, then it's just like a shitty organizational management issue. And that's very separate from the fact that it's really something that keeps women from advancing at the same rate, rate as men. And that's problematic. Yeah, it's deeply problematic. What, what is your sense of, of how we can address that? I mean, this seems like a structural problem is are there structural solutions or is it I mean I think the coming from small organizations I'm always a little bit hesitant of like really big picture yeah. <laughs> structure I think you know my solutions tend to be sort of micro solutions but oh, that yeah. if we are all, all of them. <laughs> on <board> with <laughs> yeah. you can move it in the right direction so it is sort of having those conversations and making sure that people understand how to think about their work and how to communicate things like I spend a lot of time on this, but I don't think it's getting me anywhere. Or uh, I spend a lot of time on this and like, you're just not giving me feedback on it. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm doing it well? Does that mean you don't care about it? Yeah. <laughs> what is sort of what does that look like and making sure that there's sort of a very open dialogue about where people spend their time and where they should be. And then for those other things, not letting someone step up 
because if you if you wait for someone to step up, it's going to be the same people over and over again, regardless of kind of who that is in your organization. It tends to be the same person, um, but instead finding ways to assign things. And uh, you know, I love the explicit triage or role <laughs> as to on Tuesdays, it is your day to take all the things that come in, triage them, get them where they need to be. Um, and on Wednesdays, it's someone else's job. So one day a week, your work is interrupted and you never get as much done. But right. the rest of the time, you get the same sort of heads down, productive time to work on that. So it seems like some, some part of that, some component of that is the like discovery and recognition phase, right? Being able to say, right. we have this category of work that, that we believe is this sort of glue work, this sort of undervalued piece, and it needs to be equitably distributed. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the other piece of it is to the extent possible, just being really clear and explicit and um, documenting expectations really well. So um, women and generally folks who are underrepresented in an industry tend to be more likely to focus on sort of the rules and the next steps. Like, if you give me a job description, I look at it and I see if I meet the requirements and if I don't, I don't apply. And you see, you know, sort of more dominant groups in any industry where people will look at them and be like, eh, 60% of the way there. I think I could probably do this job. <laughs> and so in the same way, when you have a job ladder, being really clear, like this is what it takes to get to the next step and making a very clear path for people to get there really helps women and underrepresented um, people kind of focus on the right things and, and move in the right way and make, and it helps managers make sure that they're promoting for the right reasons. Like we laid out what it takes and you've gotten to where it takes and you get a promotion and you haven't and here's what we're going to work on to get you there. Can you, so I, so we've talked about this, uh, use this phrase career ladder a couple of times, job ladder, career ladder. And I feel like I intuitively understand what it is, but could you, could you like define what that term means and sort of maybe explain a little bit like what role it takes in your management strategy? Yeah. So um, for me, a career letter really just lays out kind of what are the possible, what are the not necessarily possible, you can create all kinds of possible things. What are the most likely paths that someone takes um, if they stay in your organization and grow throughout their career? So it, sort of very tactically, generally for me, looks like a spreadsheet of titles. <laughs> so here are the titles that we use in our organization. Here is what that means in terms of your skills, the kinds of projects that you're working on, the kind of impact that you're having, and kind of here's how you differentiate. So if we have an analyst and a senior analyst, here's how you know the difference between that person. Um, and here's how you know whether someone is at the analyst level or the senior analyst level. And so it gives you a really clear idea of the possibilities. So you can see, you know, here's sort of the track I would be on if I stay here and keep working towards promotions on this team. Um, and it gives you really clear benchmarks. And for me as a manager, I tend to lean really heavily on career ladders and, and explicitly sit with someone and sort of look at the two, look at where they are and where they're going to be and go through and say kind of where are you on each of these things, on each of these skills, on each of these sort of types of projects. Um, how have you been able to demonstrate that here? Yeah. And if you haven't, how are we going to give you an opportunity to demonstrate that here? Um, what's next? Kind of how far does it look like you are from demonstrating this at this next level? Uh, and I've always set kind of a standard that you are performing at the next level for a quarter or a half before yeah. you get promotion. So we need to have checked all of these boxes and given you time to really prove that you're in this role. And then there you go. Yeah. And how much of that is like be an analyst for two years and how much of that is like things like intermediate SQL uh, engineer, you know what I mean? Like, is it, is it time-based? Is it skill-based? I've never really had any one, any requirements that are time-based. And yeah. I've had folks on my team sort of move between roles at very differing speeds. Um, so it tends to be more skill-based. So, you know, 
you can build a complex Excel model. You can, you know, you have proven that you are SQL fluent. You can do everything that I ask you to yeah. <laughs> and express it in SQL. Um, mm. You can kind of tackle this kind of project with this kind of impact and this level of support. So maybe at the early days, it's like you can put together an analysis that's going to shape a decision making at the, a decision at the team level and you do it with support from your manager. And then as you go up, you know, maybe the impact level grows, you're doing this for the exec team, or maybe the level of support goes away and like you're doing it totally independently, maybe some combination of those, but kind of yeah. giving people really tangible ways to understand that as you mature through your career, you're working more independently, you're doing so with deeper technical skills, and you're having an impact on a bigger portion of the organization, most likely. Cool. I really like that. I wish I, I, wish I had one, <laughs> uh, which, which I guess makes, that's what we should talk about, right? Like for everyone who, who isn't like fortunate enough to, to be working on your team, which I understand you're growing. Uh, right I am now. hiring. That's right. Come um, on down. So, so for those of us who, who aren't lucky enough to kind of be on that team, like, is this an idea that I can sort of apply to myself, right? Like, can I sort of build my own career ladder? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think, um, well, it's funny, I've actually never had a career ladder for myself. <laughs> I've never had a clear view of kind of what the next step is, and it's worked out okay. So, you know, for some people, maybe that's fine. But I find especially my teams have tended to be relatively junior, kind of pretty early out of school. And I think the kind the structure is especially valuable at that stage of your career, where you're just oh, like, for sure. yeah. there's so little that I know, what do I focus on next? Like, what's the next most important thing for me to do. Um, but, you know, I think even if you don't have a career ladder, you can absolutely kind of figure it out on your own and, you know, make a proposal. <laughs> I would say it's the kind of thing that's very valuable just in having a conversation with your manager of, you know, this is what I think it takes to be at the next level. Here's kind of where I think the biggest gaps are. Is that true? <laughs> Am I reading this? correctly and you know is there sort of some other area that i need to focus on or you know is there a clear way to communicate what's next because i think in in my own experience i think it's really easy to communicate the difference between like an analyst and a senior analyst kind of up to the manager level and then it gets yeah. a lot fuzzier because then it's just kind of like you're more impactful you're better at just taking an idea and a hundred percent finishing it <laughs> you're owning things sort of end to end but you know what's the difference between a senior manager and a director or a director and a senior director who knows <laughs> right, right. Yeah, a lot of that's kind of i think becomes wrapped up in a lot of other things right 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 yeah that makes sense no. Um, yeah, I think it's easier on the individual contributor side and I think it's kind of easier at the, the lower levels of a managerial track, but not necessarily all the way up. But, you know, it's, it's still obviously a helpful framework for a conversation. However, often you and your manager kind of go big picture instead of tactical, like what are the things I'm focusing on and why? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, I think this idea of, um, it being something that you talk about from time to time is really important to think about, especially working in a tech company, a small software company, because your opportunities for growth are gonna change a lot. So kind of being flexible about right. what opportunities you're interested in, I think. Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah, that's something I think about kind of a lot. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in your, your LinkedIn profile, which ha kind of rang out to me, is this distinction, you talk about, um, actual insights versus just analytics. And I was kind of hoping you could maybe go into that a little bit more and sort of talk about what the difference is there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the way that that has played out for me in the past is that there's sort of the ability to surface data and that's really valuable. And it's, it's sort of fundamental organizationally. Like you tend to create a data team because people can't access data. Right. <laughs> they don't right. know what they don't know and they can't make decisions effectively. And there's just a lot of sort of infrastructure work that goes into that, having a data warehouse that brings everything together, that's moderately well modeled and usable, having some tool on top of it where people can actually access things. 
some kind of dashboarding visualization yeah. tool, um, kind of whatever that is. And, and there's, that is a, a big task, <laughs> just making data available in a useful way, yeah, making sure. sure that people can quickly see what they need in the data. Um, and like, I don't mean to discount that in any way, but you know, the difference between, you know, sometimes I think it's sort of the difference between like business intelligence and analytics or there, there's sort of a distinction to be made between just making data available and then really being sort of a partner who can help interpret that data, help prioritize based on that data, who can proactively pursue ideas. So not just responding to, hey, I really want to know how this metric is trended or I want to, can you give me the data to see the impact of this marketing right. program or whatever, but to have a holistic enough view of the business to be able to quickly make connections and say, you know, we are seeing this and I need to take that information elsewhere <laughs> and make sure that there's action based right. on it. So it's, right. I think really connecting it's that piece of connecting the data to the action, um, which not every, not, not every data practitioner needs to be good at, but um, I've even worked with leaders on data teams who aren't particularly good at that part of it. And I think it really limits your impact on the organization and in a lot of ways leads to work that feels kind of dead end <laughs> sometimes. Sure. Where like I made a dashboard and I sent it to you. <laughs> I'm gonna right. go make another dashboard. Yeah, that's I think um in some part is what what described sometimes is the you know the cycle of boredom. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and so how, what do you what do you think about this? Right. This uh because we kind of you know I think sometimes in analytics it's really easy for us to kind of you know poo poo the idea of ad hoc requests and you know kind of talk in a disparaging way about you know the cycle of boredom. But I I I wonder isn't like isn't some part of any analytics team like being in service to the rest of the organization. I haven't figured out a way to avoid that. <laughs> I, think well, it's, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a good thing. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's all around balancing that. And yeah. like, there's always going to be those ad hoc requests that come in, but you want to make sure that you can respond to them scalably, that to the extent, extent possible, you're taking those as trainable moments. Like if this is something that someone should be able to figure out, then you take the time and teach them how to use the tools and make sure they know where things are. And right. next time they don't come to you until they have that next level question. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, the, for me, the goal of self-service analytics is not for the analytics team, not to be involved. It's to elevate the quality of questions that are coming to us. So mm -hmm. instead of, can you show me how to, or can you send me daily revenue? <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of the, much more impactful questions and investigations that make it to the analytics team because everybody can go pull revenue for themselves. So, so let me ask, let me ask you this. It's, um, you know, as, as the rest of the organization develops and like becomes more data literate, how do you see that sort of affecting the way that your team works, right? Like, does that change the idea of the career ladder? I mean, because we're talking in some sense, like, taking a piece of glue work and like reducing its frequency or like changing its nature, right? Like how does, how does the data and analytics team sort of grow with that, right? Like how do you elevate your team along with the, the needs of the company? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. So when I was at Indiegogo, uh, I joined and we used um, a pure SQL based visualization tool where every query was kind of independent and managing all of that really made ad hoc a huge chunk of the work that we did. Sure. So you change the definition, you're going a million places to go adapt that. And if you move to a solution that is uh, more scalable and better controlled than that, we happened to choose Looker, but there are yeah. several solutions <laughs> that will do the same thing. Then suddenly your team has so much more time because even when an ad hoc request comes in, instead of spending 20 minutes either tracking down the right query and copying it and changing the thing that needs to be copied or writing it from scratch, um, you know, it's, it's a well-known five minute exercise <laughs> to get to the same place. Um, and so you do see, I, I saw my team move from doing a lot of sort of reactive things to much more training. And that became a much bigger part of the role is like at 
the very junior level, you need to be able to sort of train people one on one and work with them on ad hoc requests. And as you move up, you need to kind of take a bigger role in figuring out. Uh, I have always had sort of a functionally aligned centralized data team. So we have a marketing analyst and a product analyst and a whatever analyst who works closely with those teams, but we all work together. So, you know, as the marketing analyst, you're in charge of figuring out how do you train the marketing team? What do they need to know? What's the, you know, what's the onboarding training that you need to give to everyone? Who's sort of the subject matter expert on data within the marketing team? How do you work with that person? How do you kind of create that sort of educator mindset rather than responsiveness? And that becomes a much bigger part of the role as you try to get more people to be self-service or and sort of more proactive as well it seems right like more mm -hmm. proactive less reactive yep. part of that comes from experience right with different parts right. of the organization you know one of, one of the things that um, i've been thinking about a lot is, is this idea of sort of uh trust trust and, and sort of uncertainty especially within organizations and when we think about an analytics team presenting data presenting findings, answering questions, existing in this sort of like service model, service in service to the business. How do you think about trust in that, right? And, and how do you handle situations which are kind of inherently about someone asking you, what should I trust, right? When, uh, when a marketer says, well, in this report on Looker or Mode or Tableau or other BI tools I can't think of, um, but Google Analytics says something else. I mean, how do you how do you navigate that discussion, right? Because it, it it seems like at the end of the day, that's that question is like, who should I who should I trust here, right? Yeah, or sort of the scarier question: Should I trust you at all? Should I trust yeah. any of these things, yeah. <laughs> or right. should I just go back to making a decision on gut? Um, yeah, uh, I again, this is not a question I have a great solution for yet. It's something that's kind of always a negotiation. I know, I know, I, I don't have silver bullets today. Um, but, you know, I think there's a few things. I think first, I find it really helpful to kind of draw the boundaries within the business of like, what should you expect from the data team? And so maybe this takes the form of an SLA, maybe it's, you know, these five metrics we protect, we proactively monitor, we will know if there's a problem. Everything else, we're not going to know. You got to tell us. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And when you tell us, we'll get back to you on the priority, but it's probably not a fix today. <laughs> as yeah. long as these five are good. It's kind of setting those expectations of what is mission critical? Where does accuracy really matter? Where is directional okay? Um, and making sure that everyone understands that the role of the data team is not to ensure 100% accurate numbers from every single system that is operating within the company. Like we can't do that. Right. <laughs> that is out of our purview. Um, how could it be, right? Like how big would your team have to be? <laughs> but you know, sometimes people really expect that from a data team. They're like, where's the proactive monitoring on every metric? Why don't we know that this changed? Why did I have to come to you and tell you about it? And it's like, well, because you're the only one that looks at this metric. Right. And it, it actually is your job to tell us that it's broken. We'll help you. <laughs> we'll help you investigate it and solve it and everything else. We can't time. look at everything all the time. <laughs> the robots can't even look at everything all the time in a meaningful way because right. there's just so much noise. Um, so, you know, setting those boundaries of, of sort of what should you expect and what do we need you to trust? And then, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's so hard when you're especially working with Google Analytics versus anything else and, you know, communicating that the value of Google Analytics and, and how you should use it and how you should not use it, I think is a constant, um, a constant battle because when you tell someone you can't use it for all these things because it's just not exactly right, then that immediately calls into the question like, well, why do we look at it at all? <laughs> Yeah, you, you sort of, um, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, right? Because it's not auditable in many ways, right? It's, right. Well, all of our data, we know all of the ways that it can break. And we know sort of all of the different places that where the, the sort of wrinkles in the creeks are. But Google Analytics, like that's a shiny interface and I can't answer anything for you beyond what you see right there. Right. <laughs> right? And it's sort of simultaneously, that like veneer of certainty, I think, makes it really challenging to them 
say like, but you should trust this stuff. And I know that sometimes it breaks, but it breaks because of us, you know, and it breaks right. in different ways. Right. Yeah. It's um, behavioral data is such a challenge because it, you can get genuine unexpected data that is real and <laughs> right. didn't see it coming. <laughs> you can get, you know, huge errors. You can break it really easily. <laughs> And staying on top of that and helping people trust it is just sort of a, a, a lot of it, I think, is really just building a feeling of partnership mm -hmm. and having, you know, I struggle with that right now. Right now, my team consists of myself and a consultant. And um, it's, there's just not enough bandwidth for everyone in the company to feel like they have a person to go to even. Like, what do I do if this is wrong? Right. I don't really even know who to go to. Um, and so bringing people on who are actively building a relationship with that team and saying like, Hey, marketing team, <laughs> I know what you're doing. I understand your priorities. Like, you know, that I'm here to fix it. So if you have a question, it's not coming from a place of like panic or necessarily mistrust. It's sort of a partnership of problem solving instead is, is really helpful and just relying on that, um, that rapport and showing <laughs> that, there are clear explanations when there are right. <laughs> kind of helping them through that, just sort of building the, the trust that you know what you're talking about, because there are just complex issues where sometimes if you take people too deep in them, it sounds like a lot of excuses and smoke and mirrors. <laughs> right. And then that makes the whole trust piece. Yeah. Difficult, right? and that's that's difficult. Really another layer of challenge. Are, are you the first data hire at, at Yertle? Um, they've had a, a long-term consultant. Um, who's built kind of the, the base infrastructure, but I am the first full-time hire and building out the rest of the team. What is that like? Is that, is that hard? I mean, is that like really invigorating? Like how, how would you describe that experience? I think it's both. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, I am definitely working harder than I worked a long time. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting opportunities. It's a good exercise in prioritization, um, which, I hadn't had to sort of prioritize quite so ruthlessly in, in quite some time. I've been yeah. really just resource constrained. Um, and only the most important things get done. <laughs> and, you know, it's always frustrating when one of those things is hiring because hiring itself is just such a time suck. Nice. And it's, you're investing so much time in hiring in the hopes <laughs> that soon, soon you'll have someone who can help share the burden. Um, you want to be a good experience for all the people going through it, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's, um, it's just, it's a lot. So, but yeah, it's, it's been really fun. I mean, there is more infrastructure, honestly, than I expected coming in sort of the way it had been described to me. I, um, wasn't expecting, but we have a really, uh, the person who's been there for several years, he's, you know, a, a really great data architect and has really built a data warehouse that, um, serves the company quite well. And so then it's more just, layering on top of that. How do we get people better access to it? How do we spend less time sort of building reports and more time partnering with the business and, and helping really kind of get more involved in that? Yeah. So it's fun, but yeah, it's a, there's a, there's a big roadmap, very long roadmap. <laughs> well, good. I mean, it's good to have a roadmap. It's good to kind of have a plan for the future. And, yeah. And and the folks, so they brought you in because they are ready to like invest in data or like, is there someone there who like is like technical in, in the space that you can communicate well with? Or, or do you feel like a lot of your work is like, is this sort of glue work uh, category? Like, what's your sense of that? Um, I, I mean, they absolutely value the work and it's, it's, it was the right time to make this strategic investment. So yeah. um, part of it was just sort of, a limitation based on the size of the team and the size of the company and sort of trying to make everything tick and tie. So um, we raised a decent sized round and this was the number one area that we're investing in as a company. So I came in a little bit before that round closed, but um, now we actually have sort of the resources and the, the strategic focus to build out a data team. But it's such a, it's such a unique business model <laughs> that um, without our, a strong data team, there are just some problems where I don't know how they would even approach solving it any other way. You know, right. we're dealing with 
tens of thousands of completely unique SKUs. So instead of having thousands of black size medium sweaters, <laughs> you have one black size medium sweater and it's got like a tiny hole right here on the collar. <laughs> and you have to track that one SKU and price that one SKU and make wow. sure that um, you're, you're sort of capturing both what shared characteristics it has with all the other black size medium sweaters and those unique ones and figuring out exactly how you're gonna deal with that. Um, and that just doesn't scale <laughs> yeah, without that, some pretty that sounds really hard. pretty significant investments in um, in automating the process of ingestion, the process of pricing, and kind of all of that. All of it, the whole stack. Yeah, that the interesting puzzles, but it also sounds like you've got like the puzzle around the puzzle as well, which which is just the whole. <laughs> Well, it's part. Of, it's part of being in charge, I guess. And that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> I'm simultaneously interested, but also not interested. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're that's sort how of. I feel about being in charge all the time. I'm like this is great. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> it's the agony and the ecstasy for sure. We are sitting at about ten minutes left, and I don't have Slack open because I don't want lots of um sort of things and, and things happening. Um, but if anybody sort of here on the Zoom has any questions, uh, you can ask in the chat if you like, or um, you can uh, turn your mic on and ask as well. Um, I, I can also just keep talking, um, but I like to open the floor up to see if anybody else um, has anything they'd like to chime in with. Okay, not a big deal. Okay, so I'm going to keep asking questions on. Uh, you know, another thing you, you mentioned in, in, in uh, is this idea of sort of democratizing data access. And I'm, I'm wondering if that doesn't ever get you into trouble. I mean, isn't there a point at which sort of giving people so much access, it allows them to sort of ask questions that produce incorrect answers or sort of format things in a funny way? Like that's something we're bumping up against right now is we've sort of over indexed on availability which allows sort of questions to be answered in ways that we didn't expect. And we're sort of really having a trust problem. Uh, so I was wondering if you'd speak to that a little bit. Yeah, well, I was actually just gonna say it really comes back to the same solutions as the trust problem and, and ultimately kind of the same causes, <laughs> just not understanding systems and not knowing what's, what is a genuine problem, what's a bug, what's um, just you doing something wrong. Right. But I think it's all about trying to figure out what that level of partnership is and what's the right level of access for different people. Um, I, I agree with you. I think I've been in situations where I've gone too far on that. And I have generally found that most people will not get themselves in trouble. Most people are, are still scared of data yeah. <laughs> and they're more likely to just keep asking the same questions over and over again, rather than to get themselves into a place of incorrect information. But, um, but there are definitely some who will just draw wrong conclusions or you use the wrong date filter and then your metric doesn't mean what you think it means. Um, that's real <laughs> and, and painful, but what I've tried to do, so, um, Specifically, I've worked a lot on Looker and, and rolling that out across teams. You can monitor people's usage really well. Yeah. You can start to kind of see who's doing what and make sure that you're connecting with the people that you need to connect with. And mm. sometimes that takes the form of explicitly being like, can I just see what you did and make sure that it's right? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I've actually had some people where I would schedule alerts for when they saved something new or when they scheduled something new, because if you schedule something as an email, you are intending to use that. And I'm just going to go behind your back and make sure it's correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, um, that's part of that partnership. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so some of it is sort of explicit partnership. Some of it is kind of like, I'm a little big brother. -y. I'm going to, I know a couple of you are, are a problem and I'm going to keep a closer eye on you. And, um, and just in general, making sure that everyone knows it's totally okay to just send something to the analytics Slack channel and say, hey, I did this, is this right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. will always be happy to take five minutes and look at it and let you know, yes or no. Because everybody's on the same page then, right? Like everybody wants the answers to be right. Everybody is right. <laughs> like, well, I just want a chart. It doesn't matter if it's right or not. Like no one is, 
<laughs> taking that position, right? It just needs to go up and to the right. As long as it does that, <laughs> I'm <right>. good. <laughs> that's right. As long as people gasp in a good way, then I'm, I, I want it. Um, and and that's, that's such a thing, right? That's such a, one of the things that I think can be an excellent output of, you know, the look or the explore sort of dashboard model, which is you can make it easier to, to do it right than yeah. to do it wrong. Right. Yeah. Whereas, you know, even a little bit of SQL can, can get somebody in a lot of trouble. I, I feel like. Yeah. Having been in a world where if everything was raw SQL and we would just say, yeah, to get what you want, you just open this and then you edit this. Look, we like, we put a content, a comment here. So, you know, go to this line and then change that date to whatever date you want to look at and then change this filter to what you're, it's just, it's horrifying to them. <laughs> and it's likely to end, end up badly, so. Well, I'm, I'm glad we're, we're kind of past that. That's, that's positive, right? Uh, Caitlin, is there, is there anything you want to sort of put out there or anything you want to plug or I know you don't have a, a Twitter account, um, <laughs> probably healthier that way. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, let me thank you again so much. This was, was really lovely. Uh, awesome. I really enjoyed our conversation. Um, thanks to y'all for, for joining us. I'm sort of like looking up at the top row now. Um, <laughs> and, and Scott and, and y'all again, thanks so much for hosting the AMA sessions. We'll see y'all again in, in November. Uh, wait, it's October now, in November. That's right. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for checking it out. This has been really fun. Thanks, y'all.